Hello everyone and welcome to the first real chapter-based lecture of the semester. We're starting out with chapter one, Introduction to Environmental Science. And the purpose of this chapter is to give you a broad overview of some of the concepts and ideas that we'll be covering over the course of the semester. We will be covering a lot of ground, but in a relatively shallow depth. And much of what we look at in this lecture will be revisited in greater detail as we move through our future chapters. Our goal for this introductory look at environmental science are the following. We are going to talk about what the environment is, what an ecosystem is, and what environmental science is as a scientific discipline. We will also discuss why it is important to study environmental science. What good does it to learn about this subject? We will look at the concepts of sustainability and the challenges that we face in pursuing sustainability, including social, political, and cultural challenges. We will introduce the relationship between humans and the environment, including the way that humans impact nature. In this realm, there are competing ideas about how decisions should be made about the environment, including two philosophies called the proactionary principle and the precautionary principle. So we will look at those and also look at how we as humans justify the different ways that we interact with the environment. This leads to conversation about ethics, what is the right way for humans to interact with the environment, and also environmental justice, what is the fair way for humans to interact with the environment. And finally, we also want to understand the scientific basis for the knowledge that we learn in environmental science. So we will look at the process of scientific inquiry, or in other words, how science is done. Compare the different types of scientific reasoning and distinguish between the goals and processes of basic science and applied science. So let's get started with really the most basic question as to what this course is about. What is environmental science? Environmental science is the study of the interaction of living and non-living things in the environment. The subject looks at the processes, cycles, and patterns that we see in the environment, which encompass both living things and non-living things. Because of this, it is dynamic, because the reality is that every day we are learning about more about how those processes work, and so the field is constantly progress progressing. Also, because of this, it is an interdisciplinary subject that takes pieces from many different sciences, including biology, chemistry, geology, climatology, and more. And environmental science doesn't just study living and non-living things separately, but also studies the interaction between them. One very important interaction that has become more and more the focus of environmental sciences is the effects that humans have on the environment, which is something we will look at in detail in this class. Given that environmental science straddles the living and non-living worlds, it's important that we understand the difference between what is considered living and what is considered non-living. There are generally eight characteristics that taken together distinguish something as being alive. And if you have all of these characteristics, then you are a living thing. But if you are missing even one of them, then you are not. So what are those characteristics? They are sensitivity or response to stimuli, meaning that organisms respond to signals in the environment such as, the, for example, a sunflower tracking the movement of the sun. Growth and development, meaning that living things grow and mature, and as they do so, they develop the traits that are genetically encoded in their DNA. Living things also reproduce, meaning they create more offspring of their own kind. Here we see this process occurring among a population of bacteria. Living organisms are cap also capable of adaption, meaning that over generations, they evolve traits and characteristics that make them better able to survive in their environment, such as the white fur coat of an Arctic fox. Living things also exhibit self-regulation, meaning they have complex mechanisms for regulating their function. 
This paramecium is showing off its ability to self-regulate using a structure called a contractile vacuole to expel excess water from the cell, thereby regulating its water content. You can see that right here. Closely tied to regulation is homeostasis, which is the ability of organisms to maintain stable internal conditions. This can include the pH of bodily fluids. It can include body temperature, for example, when you sweat. This is a way for your body to maintain homeostasis by secreting water that will evaporate and cool you. Living things also process energy. They get energy from sources in their environment and convert it to, into useful forms as needed to support their functions. Plants, for example, obtain their energy through a process called photosynthesis, where they capture the energy of sunlight and transform it into energy-rich chemical compounds. Lastly, living things have order. They have a highly organized structure that has some uniform features across all living things. For example, all living things are made of cells. Here you can see plant cells under the microscope. Animals, fungi, bacteria, any living organism you can think of is made of cells. And this idea of the organization of living things transitions us nicely into the next topic, which is levels of organization within and among living things. All living things are made of cells, and in some organisms it stops there, because some organisms are made of just a single cell, like bacteria, or that paramecium we saw a few slides back. However, in larger multicellular organisms, cells are organized into tissues. For example, human skin or muscle tissue. Then, tissues are organized into organs and organ systems, like the nervous system or respiratory system, and those organs are found nested within the organism. The organism is the individual entity. For example, this wildebeest is an organism. When you get many individuals of the same species together in the same habitat, this is referred to as a population. Species also generally live alongside other species, so the association of different populations in a particular area is called the community. In this image, for example, we have populations of wildebeest, zebra, ostriches, and even a giraffe associated with each other. Now, cells, organisms, populations, and communities, these all pertain exclusively to living organisms or collections of living organisms. So where does the non-living stuff come in? An ecosystem is defined as the community of organisms living in an area, plus the non-living environmental components, like the local climate, geographic features of the landscape, like rivers or mountains, the nutrients in the soil, etc. Ecosystems range from very large to very small. An entire forest is an ecosystem, but also a puddle of water that accumulates in your backyard. And mosquitoes lay their eggs and spawn in it. That's also an ecosystem. The broadest, most encompassing level of organization is the biosphere. The biosphere is synonymous with Earth itself. It includes all of the ecosystems of Earth, all of the land, all of the water, the things that live on it, and in it, and even parts of the atmosphere. Now, tackling the whole biosphere is a bit of a handful. So let's take one step back down the levels of organization and focus on ecosystems instead. The range of ecosystems on Earth is extremely diverse, and what life looks like in particular ecosystems depend upon several factors. These include how much sunlight a habitat gets, what kind of nutrients are present in the soil, how much organic matter there is for consumption and what type. Another factor that defines the characteristics of an ecosystem is its latitude, or in other words, the distance from the equator. Also the amount of rainfall that the ecosystem experiences, its elevation or topography, meaning the way that the geography of the land is laid out and how elevated it is. And finally, the biodiversity, 
How many different species share the habitat, which can range from just a few species to thousands? As you can imagine, depending on these characteristics, ecosystems will look quite different from each other. There are three very broad categories into which all ecosystems can be sorted, and those are marine, or in other words, ocean ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems, and terrestrial, or in other words, land-based ecosystems. Marine ecosystems are the most common since three quarters of the Earth's surface is ocean. Some specific examples of marine ecosystems are coral reefs, mangrove forests, and deep sea oceans. Each of these is marine in nature, but exhibits different distinct characteristics in its level of biodiversity, its topography, competition for resources among residents, etc. A very important resident of marine ecosystems near the ocean surface are phytoplankton, which are microscopic organisms that perform photosynthesis. They are tiny, but they are very important as altogether they are responsible for 40% of the photosynthesis that takes place on Earth and therefore play a major role in cycling oxygen in the atmosphere. A much smaller percentage of the biosphere is composed of freshwater ecosystems, approximately 1.8%. This includes freshwater lakes, rivers, and streams, which are far less abundant than bodies of salt water. But most freshwater systems ecosystems are very diverse and teeming with life. Terrestrial ecosystems, the ones that are made on that are based on land, make up the remaining percentage of the air surface. They tend to be highly diverse. And one approach that environmental scientists use to simplify the complexity in terrestrial ecosystems is divide them up into categories called biomes, many of which you pro have probably heard of. For example, the desert is one biome, characterized primarily by low level of rainfall and available water and many are located at a latitude about 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Grassland is another biome defined by a flat topography that is covered in grass with minimal trees. The tropical rainforest biome consists of regions located at a latitude near the equator that are hot and experience high level of rainfall and exhibit high levels of diversity. While the tendency to sort ecosystems into biomes can be useful, a word of caution about biomes, they can be problematic because they sometimes lead to oversimplification of our understanding of an ecosystem. For example, the Sonoran Desert that we live in belongs to the desert biome, but so does the island of Socotra off the coast of Yemen. And in terms of the range of species that live there, the two could not be more different. So keep in mind that not all ecosystems classified within a given biome are the same.